Well, good morning, everyone. As everyone just continues to filter in, we want to invite everyone here this morning. We're so glad to see you. We want to invite our family and friends who, uh, who are watching us, watching us on live. I want everyone to get up this morning and let's praise our Father in heaven. We're going to worship through some songs this morning. going this morning. Come on. I guess we're missing a few people. Let's so get our guitarist up here. Our guy from Media Shout. Give me a few moments to get ready here. I give you glory for all you brought me through, and now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. I'm moving forward to follow after you, and now I'm ready for whatever you want. Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never before. Yeah. 
If the altar's where you meet us, take me there, 
Take me there, what you need is just an offering. It's right here, my life is here, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed, I want to be tried by fire. Purify, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by fire. Purify, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. Let it fall. We want it all. Your fire is consuming. Fill this place. Set it ablaze. And now I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire, a refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you desire, Lord is my life, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you As you probably know, um, this week, Washington County Schools start. I guess tomorrow they start. And we wanted to take some time this morning to um, pray for all of our teachers and um, all of the uh, 
uh, students that will be going back to school, and um, it's kind of a new year, a fresh start after all that we've been through the last couple of years. Um, so we also have after after the service, we have a little little gift uh, for each of each of our teachers. Um, so we actually would like if if you're if you're willing and able this morning. Um, just a minute, we'd like to have all of our teachers just come in and stand down front, as well as all the students. And uh, this also, you know, some of you are homeschooling, and so we'd, we'd love to have the homeschool teachers um, come and join us in this as well. So, uh, and we would just like to spend some time uh, praying over our teachers. Then Pastor Kevin is also going to lead us in a prayer for the families of the tragedy that took place in Clear Spring this week. And um, so, if could we have the our teachers come and just stand here, as well as all the students, just just gather around this morning, and any of our teachers and students, we'd really like to pray for you guys this morning. All right, let's, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that we can come to you, and we uh, are so deeply grateful for all your blessings to us. And it is our prayer that you would be that refiner's fire. And Lord, this morning, I'd like to just pray that you would especially be with all of the, these wonderful teachers of our church. Uh, in our minds, in our hearts, they're, they're the, some of the great heroes of our community uh, just out there doing the job every day. And um, it's not easy. Um, and particularly these last two years have had some very difficult spots. But Lord, we have this sense that it's a new beginning, a fresh start. And Lord, we pray for your strength and wisdom and great blessing on uh, each of these who will be involved in this awesome and great responsibility of shaping the hearts and minds of the young people of our community. Um, we pray that you'd be with them. Bless, bless all the teachers, Lord, and, and especially we know there's some unique challenges in homeschooling, and we pray that you'd give wisdom and strength to our, our homeschool teachers as well. And then, Lord, we just lift up our, our students to you and pray. We pray, Lord, that you would help them. Throughout this summer, there are some of them who have renewed their commitment to you, and they, they have uh, just devoted their life to you, and they've been involved in serving in, in camps and in Bible school and uh, just all of the fun aspects of summer. Uh, but, Lord, I, I pray that you would help our students to be able to stand for you, even in the pressures of school and the responsibilities. And uh, Lord, may they understand that training our minds and learning all that we can is a way that we serve you and becoming, becoming better at math and, and English and science is, is a way of learning more about the world that you've created and Really, it is a part of our following you to be good students, to give our best in school. And so I pray that you would help these students to do so and to just stand uh, firmly and faithfully for Jesus in spite of all the pressure and stress that they may face. Uh, so, Lord, we just commit these teachers and students in your hands, and we pray that you would make it a great year. We pray that you would be with all the principals and staff and um, all the people that that make school happen. And may it just be a great year. And I pray that you'd help us as members of the congregation. I, I know I, um, when we pass a school, to breathe a prayer for our teachers as a reminder um, to lift them up in prayer. And uh, Lord, we just want to continue now in prayer to pray for 
particularly our, our brothers and sisters in Clear Springs. Pastor Kevin leads us. Lord Jesus, God, you are the Father of all comfort and peace. And Lord, we just, uh, we just cry out to you on behalf of our community, this Clear Spring community that has been, has been rocked this week, God, with the news of Thursday night's accident, God. And Lord, we just ask that you would just help us as we grieve, as we mourn the loss of these three lives, God, as, uh, Lord, so many questions, so many things arise and emotions arise when we face these kind of trials and when these kind of things happen, God, and our hearts are just broken over this news. And uh, Lord, we just, uh, we just want to pray for just everyone who was involved and everyone who uh, responded to that accident, to the, um, to the truck driver. God, just be with them. Um, be with the families, dear God. Um, comfort them. Lord, help them in their healing process, God, as... This is just so devastating to, to lose a loved one in this kind of a way. And so, Lord, just wrap your, wrap your arms around them, wrap your angels around them, God, and just bring them peace that can only come to you. God, I pray that if they don't know you yet, that they would find you in the midst of this, God, that you would show up um, in the most practical, most tangible ways, God, and that they would literally feel just you giving them a hug with their community, wrapping their arms around them, God. And Lord, help us to be able to support them in any way that they can. And Lord, I know that, um, that a lot of uh, the students and the, the teachers at Clear Spring are just uh, are going to have some tough weeks ahead, God, as they uh, start back in school this week and uh, there are three less than what should be there. And so, God, we just pray for them um, as they've lost their friends. Comfort them, God. God, provide them help and resources. Help them to know that they are not alone. I pray that you would unite them in a way that would be so powerful, God, this year. I pray that they would um, set aside any differences that they have and really come together and be one community, God. Lord, give them strength and courage to show up on the days that it's hard. Help them to love and to forgive and to serve one another in the midst of this. I pray for our students, God, in our church that have been affected. I pray that you would just comfort them, God. Lord, they care, they, they mean so much to us and we care so much about them, God. So Lord, let them know that they are never alone, that you are always there with them and that we are standing there with them as well. So God, we just, um, we just cry out to you and ask that you would help us in these days and these weeks and months and years to come, God. Help us to still see your goodness, still see you working in the midst of this, because you are here. You are going to be carrying us. When tragedy hits, God, you are not standing back, looking down out of the distance, but you are right here in our midst. And we thank you for your presence here with us right now. And we know that you will be with us to the very end to the very end of this age, God. We thank you that we can trust in you. We thank you that we can lean into you in these tough and difficult times. And Lord, Lord, we know that there are other things that weigh heavy on us this morning. Lord, you know our hearts. You know the places where we feel weak in, where we are tired and weary and burdened. God, would you comfort us? Would you help us to see what you're doing in our world and, and how you're moving, God? Because you are alive and you are well. And you are here Help us to be the light and the salt in this world. God, just continue to comfort us. Continue to use us as you will. And Lord, continue to be in our service today. Um, thank you that you're the one who's leading. God, we're just following. We're participating. And God, we give you full permission just to speak to our hearts, God. And uh, just speak whatever it is that you want to say, God. And we will be here. We'll be ready to hear from you and ready to respond. And we just uh, love you. Thank you for first loving us and for being here for us. This is our prayer, and we pray this in the powerful and the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated. All right, we're going to go ahead and um, dismiss our children now to go to uh, Children's Church. And our teens are 
helping out with the kids this morning. So we're, we appreciate the teens getting busy working with our children. And uh, Keith Little is going to share some announcements with us. Good morning, church. So uh, my first announcement is uh, somebody has a special birthday today, and so we'd like to wish uh, Leland Slampley a um, happy birthday. And I didn't know if he'd make it or not, but he's finally turned 29. Congratulations, Leland. So um, some people uh, next week have to work on Labor Day, and uh, some other people don't if you want to celebrate it twice. But we're going to be having a uh, get-together next Sunday uh, right after church, and um, we're going to be having hot dogs, hamburgers, chips, and cookies in the teen room after service. So it's a good time to go and uh, be here and also invite somebody else to come with you if you appreciate that. Uh, next, we have our Sunday school classes are going to be starting up again. And so on September 11th, Sunday school classes will resume. And then on Wednesday night, uh, September 7th, our family night Bible groups will resume at 6.30 here. Dwayne Brown's uh, class will not start until Wednesday, September 14th. So the men uh, will have a break for that first time, and then they'll uh, get started after that. We also have a simulcast coming up for the women. That'll be on September the 24th. And so to attend, women need to register by September 9th. And uh, this is going to be Priscilla Shires uh, going beyond simulcast. And um, men, we need some help with that. And so we need help to help men help set up, clean up, do security, uh, help out with meals, help out with the store, a lot of things. And so um, most of you guys got a list last week. And so we hopefully will be able to turn those in or I'll have some more for you to fill out later on this morning. Also, we have our uh, church offering, and so offerings you can leave in the boxes in the back here, or you can uh, do that online, and so uh, giving is uh, such an important part of our uh, faithfulness to God, and so we hope that everybody will take part in that. There's also going to be a paint fundraiser Saturday, September 10th at 4 p.m. Uh, in the Church Fellowship Hall. This is for Denny Keetle. This is uh, Tracy Clipp's cousin's fiance, and he is struggling with cancer and has a lot of... Uh, Medical bills that are up, and so they want to help uh, try to meet those needs. Uh, the last one is uh, REACH is going to be coming up um, before we know it during the winter, and we help out with that. And so there's some needs for uh, cold weather, shelter, and day resource center. So there's a list post on the bulletin board uh, in the hallway of items that are needed at REACH. And so this is in pre preparation for that. Donated items may be left at our church welcome center uh, right out here. So. If you can take part in that, that would be great. So uh, great to see everybody this morning, and Pastor Steve. Okay, well, if you'd like to take your Bibles, um, turn to Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. We want to say welcome to those of you who are guests with us today. It's so great to have you uh, worship with us today. Um, so Matthew 25, verse 14, we're looking at the parable of the talents. Before we get into the message, I want to just uh, mention a couple things. So you probably saw the tables set up in the uh, foyer this morning, and um, that is um, representative of our the small groups of our church. And you also got a, if you didn't get one, they're available in the foyer, a listing of all of our small groups. And so we're involved in signups for our small groups. And so the small group leaders will be out there in the foyer after service. And we'll have our lemonade and water and a little time of fellowship. So we encourage you to kind of use this as a time to stop by and talk with the leaders and kind of think about your schedule. All the times are in here. All the topics are in here. And um, small groups are a place where we can... Build relationships. You know, you don't, we don't have much opportunity in a worship service like this for interaction. It's kind of one-way communication. You don't talk to each other. But um, in a small group, you're able to share your concerns, share your burdens, as well as learn more uh, about the Bible. And um, so it's a very important part of our discipleship work within the church and um, really a part of God's plan that we would be a part of a group of believers who would love us and support us. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, we'd like to know if anyone is interested in baptism. Um, I don't know, maybe some of you throughout the summer, you 
kind of made a commitment to Christ and you're ready to go public with that or you've never been baptized, um, please let us know. And um, we have a few folks that are interested and um, we'd like to schedule some baptisms as we move into the, the fall. All right, let's stand together as uh, we look at today's scripture, Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, or in your version, it might say talents. Talent was a huge sum of money. We'll talk more about that in a minute. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. The master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share my master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share my master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. The master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that I return, when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, you may be seated. So as we said, um, this refers to a bag of gold or a, sum, a talent, a sum of money. What I'd like to do to kind of start out this morning is whenever we read the Scripture, we always want to put it in its context. And so in order to interpret this, we have to like go back and say, okay, what's the context? What was going on here? And so we, we look back at chapter 24. And uh, in chapter 24, Jesus now is moving to the end of his life. He's only going to be living a few more days. And um, he's going out of the temple and he says, there's these huge buildings. In fact, the temple was like one of the wonders of the world at that time. It was like one of the most beautiful buildings in the whole world. And he, he says to his disciples, um, do you see all these things? Um, Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. So Jesus kind of starts this conversation about what's going to happen in the future. And as he's preparing to be crucified, he says, this beautiful temple that you see, it's all going to be destroyed. A little later, they're up on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples ask him a kind of a follow-up question. Tell us, they said, when this will happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? 
Now, a little bit later in this, this passage, so now we're down to verse 34, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all of these things will have happened. So, Jesus now addresses their question throughout chapter 24. When will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming? So, as followers of Jesus, we affirm that Christ is coming again, and in, passage, in chapter 24, Jesus lays out some of the signs of his return. But this is kind of a complicated chapter because he's also talking about what's going to happen more in the near future because actually the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. That's when the Roman army came and just obliterated the, the, the city. Um, the Roman army came down, surrounded the city, People were starving inside the city. They finally broke through the walls, and it was a total bloodbath. Um, the temple was destroyed. All of its riches, the gold in the temple, was stolen by Rome. An estimated 29,000 prisoners were taken that, that was at that time. So Jesus' prediction, not one stone will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Um, if you look at the screen, here's like an artist's rendering of the sack of Jerusalem. So this is a historical thing that, you know, actually happened. Um, I mean, it was just a, a total devastation. And so this is part of what Jesus is talking about and predicting here. And so what's hard is, on the one hand, he's talking about what happened in AD 70, but then in chapter 24, he's also talking about what's going to happen in the future. When he, when he returns. So it's a little bit difficult to distinguish, well, is he talking about AD 70, or is he talking about, you know, the destruction of the temple, or is he talking about what's going to happen when he returns? But he gives us these signs. And in fact, there's like a, there's a whole list of signs, and it kind of reads like our newspaper headlines. So this is just briefly, this is what Jesus said. Here's the signs that Jesus is coming again soon. He talks about wars and rumors of wars. He talks about famines, earthquakes, the persecution of Christians, the increase of wickedness, um, the gospel being preached to the whole world. And he says it will be a time of great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. So we look around at our world and what's happening in various places and could be taken right out of our headlines, couldn't it? So, um, and then, then Jesus said, so after, when you see these signs, and this is down in verse 30, all the people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven in power and great glory. And he'll set right all of the wrongs of this world. As the dead in Christ will rise. We'll be given new bodies and um, we'll be made new. So it's not surprising that when we look at this list of some of the signs that many see how these signs are lining up in our day. There's a feeling, certainly that, that I have, that the second coming of Jesus must be getting close. It seems like, you know, this, this list is becoming more prominent. But on the other hand, I don't spend too much time trying to figure out these signs because Jesus made it clear that not, only, not even he knows the date of his return. So let me, uh, here's in verse, verse 36, Jesus said this, but about the day or hour, no one knows, not even, even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So it seems like it's getting near, but it still could be hundreds of years out. We just don't know. Not even Jesus knows when his return will be. So I figure if Jesus doesn't know and only God knows, I have more important things to do than try to figure out what Jesus doesn't know. <laughs> I'd prefer to focus on what I believe to be the primary response to Jesus' coming, which he made very clear. In verse 42, he said, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know that what day your Lord will come. And he says, he's going to come like a thief who breaks into your house, and he comes at a time when you don't expect it. You know, thief comes when you're on vacation or you're asleep in bed. 
So the main message that Jesus conveys when he talks about his second coming is found there in verse 44. Jesus says, you must be ready. Be ready. I mean, live ready. Don't go to places. Don't do things that you would be ashamed of Jesus knowing about if he came because he knows about it anyway. Keep watch. Be ready. Because the Son of Man, Jesus, will return in a time when you don't expect it. Live in a constant state of readiness. It could be any time. It could be tonight. It could be tomorrow. It could be years from now. He wants us to work with the Holy Spirit then, not only to be ready ourselves, but also to share the gospel with as many people as we can so that when we're ready, they are ready when Jesus returns. So be aware of the signs, yes. Don't stick your head in the sign. Be aware of what the Scripture teaches. But most importantly, be ready at any time and lead as many people as you can to Jesus so that they are ready too. Okay, so that's actually all context. When we get to chapter 25, Jesus tells these parables, and the, what the parable's about is, is saying, how do we live? We live in this in-between time between the resurrection of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. And there's a lot of pain, and there's a lot of struggles, and there's a lot of brokenness, and things are, are a mess. And sadly, um, teenagers are killed. And, you know, we, we live in this time of great brokenness and sadness between the resurrection, the, the, sec, the resurrection of Jesus and his second coming. How do we live? How do we live until he returns? And I'm just going to give you a I have two, two points this morning you can kind of hang the sermon on. The first one from the parable of the talents is embrace what you have. Embrace what you have. So in Jesus' parable, the wealthy master is, gonna go, is going away, and he gives a portion of his wealth to each of his three servants to care for in his absence. Now, as we said, the New International Version, when we reread, the New International Version um, kind of interprets this for us, and it talks about five bags of gold and two bags of gold and one bag of gold. Other versions say five talents, two talents, one talent. So what's a talent? Well, we kind of know how we use the word as sort of our different abilities, but and, and that this passage includes that, but a talent was a sum of money. It was a very large sum of money. It was equal to, and some of you might have a footnote in your scriptures that point this out, about 20 years of a day laborer's wages. 20 years' wages is a talent. And that was, like, very, very valuable. So I don't know. How much does a day laborer make? Well, I don't, I don't really know, you know. Let's say, let's just pick a number, $35,000. Okay. So it's time to go back to school. Um, so 20 years, um, you know, 35000 a year. 20 times 35,000 is what, you math students? $700,000, one, one talent. Yeah, kind of, it's some frame of reference. Okay, so the first guy gets five times $700,000, which is actually 3.5 million. Yeah, okay. $3.5 million. I mean, this is big money. Second guy, two times 700000 at $1.4 million. And the third one, a measly $700,000. I wish I had that measly. No. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a story Jesus tells. Well, what's the meaning? Well, we're the servants. You and I are the servants. And we've been entrusted with resources. You know, we, I mean, you drove here today, you filled up your gas tank, and you got some money, some resources. It's not just our resources, it's broader than that. It's our abilities, our knowledge, the things that we've learned, our relationships, our possessions. It's all that God has entrusted to us 
in life. You know, we only, we only have it for a certain number of years, right? Can't take it with you. Now, it's important to point out in, the, in this story that the master is not God. The master isn't the God figure in this story. Rather, he's like an imperfect earthly boss. And he entrusts this huge wealth to his servants. But Jesus' idea is that if an imperfect earthly boss trusts his servants with his wealth, how much will our loving, perfect Heavenly Father entrust us with his resources? Five talent, two talent guy, they get to work. They invest their master's funds wisely. I don't know what they did. They started businesses. Uh, they, they provided capital. Uh, I don't know. I don't think they had the stock market back then. But anyway, they, they, they invested it. And um, But the one town guy, he digs a hole. He's afraid of losing his master money. He, dig, he digs a hole in the ground, buries the money. He doesn't want to do anything that would put his money at risk. So the parable then prompts us to ask, what do you have that you need to embrace? What opportunities has God placed in your hands to extend His grace in our broken world? Now, the truth is, every Christian has something God has given them to accomplish His purposes in the world. We all have different talents, but there are no zero-talent Christians. You say, no, I, could do, I can't do anything. Not, I don't, not me. That's not true. There are no zero-talent Christians. Might have five, might have two, might have, maybe only have half. I don't know. But no zeros. There are no zeros in Christ's kingdom. So we've been given these various resources in order to further God's purposes in the world to make it a better place. But what are His purposes? Well, we go down again in the context, if we go down to verse 35, there's, Jesus tells another parable that we don't have time to get into, but He says that one of the things that's going to count with God at the end of the time of judgment Actually, the first one he says, I left it off the list. Did we feed the hungry? Did we give water to the thirsty? Did we welcome to the stranger? And the word that Jesus uses can also mean foreigner. Did we clothe those who had none? Did we look after the sick? Did we visit those who were in prison? So Jesus said, this is my work. This is what I've called you to do. There's some other key verses throughout the, the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So it's sharing the gospel, telling the good news of Christ. That's, that's His purpose. That's why we're here. That's what He wants us to use our gifts and abilities to do. And then Matthew 28, the, call it the Great Commission. Make disciples baptize them, teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Embrace what you have. What are the unique gifts and abilities that God has given you to accomplish His mission of feeding and giving water and welcoming and clothing and healing and visiting and sharing the gospel and making disciples? What's your part in Christ's endeavor? Embrace what you have. Second one, embrace the responsibility. I'm going to say take the risk. They kind of go hand in hand. So the first two servants with their five and two bags of gold decided to embrace the responsibility given them to the master. They took the risk. They invested what they had entrusted to them. I, I have a pastor friend who surprised me when she said recently that when she was a little girl, she loved going to her big brother's baseball games. Surprised me because I never heard a little sibling say they love going to their, you know, big siblings' um, games. 
But then she clarified that it wasn't that to watch her brother play that she loved, but it was the stack stand that she loved. <laughs> and she went on to tell how whenever she went to her um, brother's baseball game, uh, her mom and dad would give her a little bit of money. And so she could go to the snack bar, and she said she, she always bought some Jolly Ranchers. I don't know. You could get a few of them for a quarter. Anybody like Jolly Ranchers? I love the watermelon. The watermelon is my favorite. Okay. <laughs> so she would, she would, you know, get her quarter. You know, you could get some Jolly Ranchers. And, and then her brother would also get a, a quarter, get a quarter, and after the game they'd buy some Jolly Ranchers. But they didn't eat them. They didn't eat them. They'd stick them in their school backpacks, and they'd wait and until they were on the bus on the way home, and the kids were hungry. And then they'd jack up the price <laughs> and sell them on the bus for 50 cents, what they had bought for 25 cents, double their money. That was a great business. And they, you know, then they'd take their proceeds and kind of re reinvest and buy some more. It was going good until one of the kids, like, told their mom and dad what they were doing, and their mom and dad shut them down and said, no, you're not going to price gouge your classmates. <laughs> Couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> it was a great story my, my friend was, was telling. And Well, again, we don't know, but the first two servants started a business, and they made some wise, wise investments. We don't know what, what they did, but they doubled their money. It's like my fast pastor friend did as a girl. And while the five and two talent guys were going to work, they were busy. The one talent guy was digging a hole, hiding his master money in it. Now, what he was doing wasn't necessarily sinful, but it was, it was done out of fear. He was cautious. He was playing it safe. He was unwilling to embrace the responsibility and take the risk. In fact, he blames the master for his decision to bury the master's money. I knew you were a hard man, he says. You know, you're, a, you're a businessman. You're a tough guy. So I was afraid. I went out, hid your gold in the ground. Gave him back the one talent. The master's furious. He calls him wicked or worthless and lazy. So what do we do with this? How does it relate to our lives? Well, I think it relates in this way that how often do, do we hold back because of fear? To say God what, what God wants us to say. Or to give in, get involved in a situation that where well, maybe we can make that better. Or to volunteer for a ministry or to strike up a conversation with our neighbor that might lead to a conversation about God. We hold back. We bury the treasure. It's easier not to say anything. We fear might, we might lose, so we do nothing. I hear people say, I could never do that. Oh, I'm just not comfortable leading. Oh, I can't talk with people. It's fear. Every one of us is entrusted with some opportunities and gifts and money. They're on loan from God to us. And we don't get to keep our talents, but we're challenged by Jesus to leverage what he's given us to do the work of God in the world to the maximum of our ability. The question is, like, how can we leverage what we have? to do the work of Jesus in the world to its maximum. That's what the story that Jesus told is prompting us, it's probing us to say, what has God given you? How are you using it? How are you a part of accomplishing on your job, in your neighborhood, in your role at church, 
as you go to school, how are you a part of accomplishing Christ's mission? How can we leverage what we have to do, what Jesus wants to accomplish in the world? So one, one talent guy, he blows it, he, he blames his boss, and now he has to live with the consequences. His decision to bury the master's treasure. And what's, what he got is taken from him and given to the, the five-talent guy. And now he has to live with the regret of thinking what God might have done if he had taken responsibility and been willing to risk his comfort and security. I had someone tell me that when you, I just had a birthday, I can now go on Medicare. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I had somebody tell me recently that, you know, as, as you get older that, and this is Eric Erickson, he's a developmental psychologist, and um, he kind of out, outlined the stages of adult development, but in, in um, the, our, kind of the oldest times of our lives, that the, our, the, what we kind of go between the two parallels of either integrity, or I can't remember what the other one was, <laughs> despair. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens. <laughs> I did it. I got it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I got it. It's we're there, integrity or despair. Okay? You know, you either can let, look back on life and say, you know, I gave it my best shot. Actually, somebody told me, do your reasonable best. I kind of like that because I could always probably do a little better. I'm a perfectionist. Do your reasonable best. So, you know, integrity, look back, okay. Or you look back with regrets. Oh, man, I didn't do this. I could have done that, you know. And, and that, that leads to despair. So we get to, to the end of life, we, we, we kind of, we, we're kind of between those, those two feelings, like integrity, despair. And I think that was some of what, was, what is in, inherent in Jesus' story to the guy who didn't invest what had been given to him. You know, just kind of buried his chances, just buried his opportunities, just squandered his talents and didn't invest his resources. He's like weeping and gnashing of teeth and it's a place of despair can't do it over. There's no do-overs. I made my decision, and it's done. So we, we, live, we live in that place, and, and the one town servant lives with regret for the opportunities that he missed. Now, another, uh, another this is kind of a side meaning, meaning here of the parable is don't compare yourself to the five-talent people. <laughs> We, we all have. It's interesting. It says they, he entrusted five, two, one, according to their abilities. So God's given us what he knows we can handle in the way that he wants to use us uniquely. And we're only responsible for what he's given us. Um, I'll be honest. I can, I can sometimes get in a group of preachers and uh, you know, I can kind of compare myself and say, well, man, I wish I had a big church like that. <laughs> I've heard him preach, wow, I would love to be able to preach like that, you know. I can kind of get into this, well, I wish I had that many talents. Like, <laughs> you know, nix that. No room for that. It's like God's just given us the unique amount of however many, we're, we're all different, right? And whether you got a quarter or a half or one or two or five or ten, it's like just use them faithfully. It's, Jesus again and again says, well done, good and faithful servant. It's faithfulness, again, 
faithfulness, being faithful to use what God has entrusted to us. And not getting upset because somebody else is a little bit, you know, better at it. Or you, know, you don't have to be jealous of the guy who's rich and drives a Mercedes or whatever. <laughs> Just be content with what you have. And use it faithfully. I'm a one-talenter. Use my one talent. That's what God requires of me. If I'm a half-talenter, use my half. You kind of summarize this whole, this whole um, parable. With, it's not really good English, but use what you got where you're at. Use what you got where you're at. Step out. Take the risk with the opportunities and talents God has given you. For you students, develop your mind. School sharpens your mind. <laughs> Gives you some resources to be able to understand the world that God has created and the mistakes of the past. What were the mistakes of the past so we don't want to repeat them in the future? So, it's your opportunity to develop those mental talents and abilities that God has entrusted to you. Step out. Take the risk with the opportunities and talents that God's given you. The hinge verse of this whole passage is verse 19 where it says, After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. So it is true that we will give an account to God of what we did with what he's given us. And we can either make excuses and blame God like the one talent guy for not giving us more and dig a hole and bury what he's given us, waste it. Or I can take a risk. I can use what he's given me to accomplish the mission of Jesus in the world. Now, this whole thing, again, the context, it takes place within days of Jesus' crucifixion. We said the master of the story is not God because God is much more loving and patient and gracious with us than the master. He's about to give his son as an expression of his forgiveness and grace and mercy. So if you're here today and, you know, you kind of think you're more like the one talent guy, You've kind of buried your gifts. You've wasted your abilities. Maybe because of fear. Maybe you've made excuses. Maybe it's blaming God for not giving you more. Well, God's not going to send you away into the darkness. He's always the God of another chance, at least as long as this life we're in this life. He extends his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. But he challenges you today. What has God given you? And how would God want to use it in his kingdom work? Here and now. In your school, in your neighborhood, on your job, and in our church. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, we thank you today that you are a God who trusts us with your work in the world. Thank you that you trust us with, with money. You trust us with influence. You trust us with families, relationships. with our belongings, with our minds. We pray this morning that you would help us to make our talents available to you. 
Don't let us give in to fear. Don't let us waste what you've entrusted to us. I pray for the students going back to school. You've given them sharp minds, many abilities. I pray that you would help them to use their minds and abilities to be a part of your kingdom work in the world. Because it's a pretty messed up place and you choose to do your work through us. To feed and to clothe and to visit and to welcome and share the good news. You work through us. So, Father, I pray that you would be with the students, and I pray that you would be with the teachers as they be given the task of shaping hearts and minds, young hearts and minds. And be with all of us that we might make, our, might make ourselves available to do your work, your kingdom work in the world. Do that what, that you have entrusted to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, and the worship team is going to lead us in a song. Let's stand together.
Thank you, worship team. Um, just want to remind you, um, you know, take a little time to wander around at the tables and check out the small groups and um, uh, try it out, you know. It doesn't hurt. You can just sign up. You can give it a try and um, just give it a try. Also, um, you know, if you don't really know exactly what to do with today's message, we, there was a handout that you got about volunteers that are needed. So there's some ministries that you can jump into and help out and uh, use your talents to, to do God's work through the church. Well, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, the fact that we know that you're coming again, and we pray that through the Holy Spirit and your strength and your daily presence with us that um, we might be able to live in a way that honors you. As we begin a new school year, as we uh, move back into some of the routines of life, we ask, Lord, that your spirit would go before us and give us strength, and we might rely on the precious presence of Jesus. We can't do your work by ourselves, Lord. We rely on your Holy Spirit. You are the one that gives us strength and the wisdom to carry out your purposes in the world. And Lord, you need a people in this day who will faithfully let Jesus shine through them by his Spirit. And Lord, may we be those people. May we be those people through which you can shine, which you can bring healing and life and peace to our world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We believe in God our Father. We believe in God the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. We believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. Oh, we believe in the name of Jesus. We believe in God. I got